All right, next up for us is Dr. Katie Stack Morgan. Uh, we're gonna switch gears here from flying to driving uh, on Mars. And she is the uh, NASA JPL Perseverance Deputy Project Scientist. And she's gonna give us a mission update. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much for the uh, invitation and opportunity to present a mission update here at the uh, Mars Society uh, virtual meeting. Um, <clears throat> happy to share with you what Perseverance has been up to uh, you've already heard now uh, two talks about the Ingenuity helicopter and the exciting things that it's been up to. Uh, so I'll share with you what the rover has been doing. Uh, and we're just about to emerge from conjunction as you, you've heard about uh, and are excited to continue our exploration uh, in Jezero Crater. Okay. All right, so I'll just give a, a brief mission status here. So uh, I think as of today, it's all 233 on Mars for Perseverance as well as Ingenuity and we're preparing to return after solar conjunction. The rover is healthy and all its science instruments are functioning with no significant issues, which is fantastic. We've driven uh, about 2,600 meters as of SOL 209, which was the last time we, we moved. Um, we've acquired three abrasions using the abrading bit on the rover's uh, turret, and I'll, I'll show you images of that. And thus far we have collected and sealed, we, well, we have sealed four sample tubes, uh, which includes two rock cores collected, one atmospheric sample, and we have sealed one witness tube. And I'll talk more about what is currently in the Perseverance sample collection a, bit, a little bit later. And um, as of uh, a couple months ago, we delivered over 1.3 terabytes of mission data uh, to the planetary data system that's now available to the public. Uh, and so we're excited to share the, the mission's data with, with everybody and, and to get everyone's eyes on, on the Perseverance rover data. All right. Uh, as, as many of you know and are familiar with, uh, the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover is part of a notional three mission Mars sample return campaign involving uh, Perseverance as the first leg responsible for collecting samples uh, and handing them off either by leaving a, a depot on the surface of Mars or transferring in some other way uh, to the next leg of the mission that may involve a, 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 a lander and, and a fetch rover. Uh, and then those samples would get blasted into a rendezvous with an orbiter that would bring them back to, to Earth. But Perseverance, of course, is the first step here. And so our focus on, on the 2020 mission is to collect the samples and do the best job of documenting the samples that we can. Um, these mission objectives are also probably familiar to you at this point, uh, but the Mars 2020 mission has four main objectives, including characterization of the geology and habitability of its landing site, uh, seeking signs of ancient life and, and understanding the preservation conditions under which ancient life might have, have been present and exist in the rocks that it explores. Uh, those first two objectives feed very naturally into our sample caching and collecting objective. Uh, Perseverance has the ob objective to put together uh, a returnable and scientifically compelling cache of samples for possible future return to Earth. Um, and then as previous rover missions have for Mars, uh, Perseverance is moving forward um, objectives to prepare for human exploration of Mars. And there's some exciting technology demonstrations associated with the rover uh, to advance that objective. Uh, this, is the the, this is the rover itself and the instrument payload on the rover. Uh, Perseverance carries seven science instruments, which include both brand new instruments like the Sherlock and Pixel instruments on the turret of the rover, as well as RIMFAX, our ground penetrating radar, um, and MOXIE our technology demonstration to produce oxygen from Martian CO2. Um, and other instruments we have are, are based on heritage, primarily from the Curiosity rover instrument payload, including MassCam-Z with its zoomable panoramic cameras, uh, SuperCam heritage from Curiosity's ChemCam instrument and Meta heritage from Curiosity's REMS uh, weather station. And so this uh, payload is, is uniquely well-suited to accomplishing the science objectives of the rover. Uh, and thus far has been performing uh, brilliantly on the surface of Mars. Uh, but what really would distinguish is Perseverance, of course, from previous rovers is this uh, sample collection, coring and caching uh, component. And Perseverance has the ability to collect 43 total sample tubes, 30 of which, 38 of which are, are capable of, of accepting uh, rock or regolith samples and five that we have designed to act as witness tubes that we can choose to seal at various points in the mission uh, as a way to record and document the, the kind of state of the interior of the rover in the sample caching system at the time that those tubes are sealed. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about the landing site uh, and, and 
Perseverance's field site on Mars. Um, Perseverance is exploring Jezero Crater, which is an impact crater on the western rim of the Isidus impact basin, which is one of the largest and oldest impact basins on the surface of Mars. Um, Jezero is very well positioned to tell us about the history of Mars and geologic processes on Mars and that it is bookended very nicely by both this Isidus impact basin, as well as the Surge major volcanic activity over there that we think took place around 3.5 to 3.8 billion years. So the deposits that we see in Jezero, uh, in and around Jezero, likely bookended by these two significant geological events um, and uh, deposits that we explore with the rover are likely related to both these events as well as uh, surface sedimentary processes that occurred in between these two major events on Mars. We'll zoom in a bit. Here is, is Jezero seen up close with topography overlaying here. And um, this is where you can see some of the reasons why we chose Jezero amongst the many craters on Mars for, for Perseverance's field site. Um, and Jezero contains one of the best preserved ancient delta deposits on Mars. Um, and we think it contains a diversity of habitable environments representing both surface habitable environments as well as subsurface. And really what attracted us to Jezero was the fact that it has conclusive evidence for containing an ancient lake and that it has inlet valleys and out, an outlet valley, suggesting that the, the crater comple completely filled um, and, and that water then spilled out of the crater. Uh, and so Perseverance is focused on exploring the, the deposits of uh, interior deposits of Jezero Crater uh, including the Jezero Delta that you can see annotated here, providing what we think is a, a 3.5 to 4 billion year window into planetary evolution and, and hopefully habitability on the surface of Mars. So uh, of course, Perseverance landed uh, to great fanfare and very successfully uh, in Jezero Crater on February 18th, 2021, and has been exploring uh, in Jezero since then. Uh, this is a high rise in the color high rise image showing uh, a zoom in to where Perseverance landed and where it's been exploring. So Perseverance landed at Octavia E. Butler landing site. Uh, it's the blue dot right under that, that green square. Um, and shown here in, in a dashed yellow line is the, the strategic path that we have outlined for, for Perseverance in these first the first year of its exploration here in the crater. Um, and while we ultimately intend to go to the Jezero Delta, which you can just see up there in the upper left corner of the image at a point marked three forks just off the front of the Delta, we decided to focus um, this, this first couple of months and, and, and year essentially on the, the geologic units of the crater floor, particularly heading to the south uh, to explore um, this area shown here in green um, as our first exploration campaign. And I'll talk through some of the, the things we've seen along the way and, and, and what we think uh, is going on in this, this part of the crater. So here's a zoom in here. You can see Octavia E. Butler landing site there. And this is the rover's actual path that it has traversed since landing. Uh, and Perseverance is shown there in the blue dot. Ingenuity is there in green. And that does represent the current location of, of both Perseverance and Ingenuity. Um, and We've been exploring, uh, we've gone, been going around the crater, these crater floor units, and I'll, I'll flash on a geologic map that the, the Perseverance Science team has put together, showing that we have been skirting this, what could be a pretty significant geologic contact, con contact within the crater floor units, and could represent a significant unconformity or gap in time between deposition of what we call the crater floor fractured one unit, um, and then the crater floor fractured rough unit, their CFFR, uh, in, shown there in tan that the rover has been primarily uh, driving over. But just recently, right before conjunction, Perseverance crossed that contact. And I'll, I'll show you some images of, of what these different rock units look like and why we're excited about them. All right, so while we were exploring the crater floor fractured rough, that unit I showed previously in tan, we saw two major types of rocks. Um, a, a, a rock type that we called low relief pavers. You can see that over there on the left, and that's very typical for what these rocks have looked like. They have rounded edges, low relief, and kind of this rubbly uh, surface texture. But over off to the east, uh, in, in rocks we haven't really explored up close yet, we could see that there were these massive high relief blocks. And one thing to note here is the, the near complete absence of any kind of internal structure or layering uh, or sedimentary structures like ripples, dunes, cross bedding, that can often give us an indication of what the depositional origin of these rocks is. So there's been a bit of a challenge in trying to figure out what, what are these rocks. Um, but these two images here are very representative of the types of rocks that we have seen thus far with the rover. So um, 
after after landing and check out and, and performing the first couple of helicopter flights that you've heard about, uh, Perseverance headed south to um, a location called Rubion, where we attempted our first abrasion and sample attempt, attempt in the rocks of the crater floor. And, and again, we're interested in these rocks from a sampling perspective because they are one of the major units uh, in Jezero Crater, also possibly amongst the oldest and, and, and youngest uh, units, depending on whether you're in uh, CFF1 or CFFR. Um, and so we, we wanted uh, very much to sample this, this unit and have this be representative of, of the Jezero Crater floor. Um, so here was our very first abrasion on Mars. The Perseverance uh, drill has the ability to pick up an abrading bit, and we can basically abrade a small patch of the surface. You can see that here. Um, and, and you can see actually in these bright and dark minerals and, and holes in the rock. That's what, if you can see my mouse, that's what these areas here, these dark areas are actually holes in the rock. And these textures that we saw in the Braden patch weren't necessarily what we expected to see um, from the weathered surfaces of these rocks. So this was a, a very nice and pleasant surprise to see this level of detail and this kind of texture exposed in these abraded patches. Uh, of course, we threw our full instrument payload um, at this abrasion patch, including uh, the Watson camera, the Sherlock and Pixel uh, to get mineralogy and geochemistry and look for organics, as well as the SuperCam laser using all of its techniques, SuperCam instrument using all of its techniques to try to better understand the geochemistry and composition of, of this rock, which we hoped would be representative of the crater floor unit in Jezero. And so what we found when we analyzed this rock is that it has a mafic composition similar to that of a, of a typical basalt. Uh, that's not uncommon uh, on Mars. Mars is a basaltic planet. And for example, many of the sedimentary rocks that we have observed in, in Gale Crater with the Curiosity rover also show very similar mafic composition. So the composition alone doesn't necessarily tell you what the rocks are or how they got there. Uh, but we also interestingly saw and observed uh, salt minerals, particularly sulfates, as well as sodium chloride. And so those aren't necessarily uh, minerals that we think are the primary minerals that were there when this rock originally formed, uh, but represent later alteration of this rock and perhaps substantial interaction of this rock with water. We also observe iron oxides, as well as silicates like plagioclase and pyroxene, typical of an igneous, igneous composition. We also have some other interesting minerals like apatite and magnesium carbonate that might be able to tell us something important about what the water that was interacting with these rocks was like and, and how habitable that those, those situations might have been. Um, and so the interaction of this rock with water gives us kind of astrobiology uh, excitement uh, because anytime you, you have water flowing through rocks, you have the potential to be creating habitable niches within this rock, these rocks. And so they were of, of high uh, priority for us to, to go ahead and sample. Um, so we did attempt to sample, um, but unfortunately we're, we're disappointed uh, when we got the image of the cash cam from the cash cam, which is, is the camera that images down the tube. You can see that there on the upper left and found an empty tube. And, and as it happens, uh, it appears that we uh, pulverized this rock as we attempted to drill it, uh, suggesting that it was actually quite soft. Uh, again, a surprise. We've driven over this rock and not with the rover and not made much of an effect on it, uh, but we, we ended up uh, not being able to capture a sample. But we do actually have a sealed tube containing Martian atmosphere. So we consider this to be our first atmospheric sample, which is one which was an objective that we were planning to accomplish at some point in the mission, but we, we knocked it out uh, quite early. Okay, so after Rubion and, and our um, unexpected first sampling attempt, we decided we wanted to try rocks that were, were a little bit different and perhaps offered a better chance of success at, at drilling. Um, and so rather than being in the very low elevation region, which is where Rubion was, we decided to go up onto a feature called our 2B Ridge. And you can see that they're going off to the west. Uh, and thought we might have better luck sampling the hard rocks that capped the ridge. So we drove along the ridge, uh, but as we were driving, we noticed a, a distinct change in the style of the rocks. I had mentioned before that rocks seen early in the mission had no evidence or, or very little evidence for internal structure and layering. But as we drove along our 2B ridge, we started to see very obvious layering. And this is, these are the kind of, of, of textures within rocks that you start getting you thinking about sedimentary origins. Um, and, and wind or water deposited rocks um, or, or possible uh, cla volcanic clastic or ash interpretations as well are, are, are other ways to produce layering in rocks. And so those are things that we are starting to think about now that we are seeing 
uh, more structural and textural information within, within the rocks that Perseverance is seeing. Um, so as we drove along, we, we eventually were able to ascend onto the ridge at, at a place called uh, Citadel, where we attempted our first pair of samples and successfully acquired our first pair, pair of samples on a rock that we call Rochette. And here you can see it, it in this image from, from the MassCam Z, or actually this is a, a, a HasCam image. Um, and while this block is, is, is separate, um, from the outcrop, you can see it's broken off there from the fragment in the back. We think it's representative of, of this kind of broken up but, but fairly continuous layer of blocks. So while it's not in place itself, it's likely not moved too far from where it was originally deposited. But you can see some key differences with the previous uh, rock that we were unable to sample. It's standing tall, it has uh, sharp facets on it, and indeed we were, we were successful in, in sampling. We acquired an abrasion here as well, and you can again see the light and dark minerals, mineral grains within this rock, as well as this kind of light tone uh, that we think represents some of these alteration minerals precipitating in, in perhaps voids in the rock, as well as the iron oxides that show up there in, in brown. You also might see these uh, purple uh, splotches over here on the, the weathered surface of the rock, and we think that might represent a, a coating of some kind that we haven't yet been able to uh, analyze specifically that coating with an instrument that would tell us exactly what it's made of. But we think, we think that is indeed a coating on the surface of this rock. All right, so if we do a side-by-side -side comparison of, of our first two abrasion patches, you can see over on the left, this was our first rock and the rock we were unable to sample and it's got those holes in it. Uh, the Belgard abrasion does not have those holes. It also has much straighter, cleaner uh, edges to the abrasion patch and that gave us uh, good confidence that we would be successful actually in, in sampling this and that the rocks seem to be more coherent um, and, and better held together. Um, I also wanted to show you this really cool uh, image flip um, where in the back we have the Watson image and then the, in grayscale you see the Sherlock ACI image. It's an image that the Sherlock instrument takes uh, with the ability to resolve very, very fine scale texture within these rocks. And this is kind of like what you might expect to see in a thin section of a rock here in, in the lab on earth. Um, and this arrow here is pointing to what could be some rounded grains uh, or kind of semi-rounded grains within this. So we're very much thinking about, you know, are these rocks volcanic? Are they sedimentary? Are they clastic? Are they crystalline? Um, and using the, the fabrics, uh, provided in these, Im these amazing images that we're taking to help us better understand what these rocks are. This is an example of one of the um, uh, element maps that the pixel instrument can make. It's an x-ray spectrometer. Um, and here we can kind of color code the distribution of different minerals in the rocks that we look at. And so here in yellow, you can see where pixel has detected sulfate minerals in this rock. So again, we're, we're starting to build this picture where we have an igneous original composition of, of, of these rocks. Um, with some fabrics suggested that they could be coarse crystalline igneous rocks like, like lava flow, but in other places we see things that are more suggestive of maybe clastic or sedimentary deposition. Um, but then we have interaction of these rocks with water to form minerals like these sulfates likely at, at a later stage and perhaps related to groundwater related to the Jezero Crater Lake. So again, these rocks are exciting from an astrobiology per, per perspective in that they might have had very small uh, habitable niches in these rocks and particularly in these, these voids where you had water moving through the rocks and perhaps creating a, a, a small environment that, that could have been suitable uh, for ancient Martian microbes. All right, so we uh, successfully abraded and then we successfully uh, made, a, made a drill hole uh, into this rock and we're very relieved to find that we had a coherent, cohesive rock sample um, in the drill bit and we declared success on our first sampling attempt. Um, this sample is now sealed into 266 and is sitting within the body of the rover um, in Perseverance's sample collection. Um, we then follow that up with the acquisition of a pair. Uh, so a, a, a sample acquired very close to that first uh, Montagnier sample, we call it Montagnac. Um, and we acquire pairs because we have an idea that we may put down uh, one or more caches uh, on the surface of Mars, um, perhaps one inside Jezero and perhaps one outside Jezero. So in order for each of those caches to be as complete as possible and for the Mars sample return future missions to be able to make a decision about which cache it makes sense to go pick up, um, we are acquiring paired samples so that we can make sure that each of those caches is as complete as possible. 
And so we successfully acquired our first sample pair here at the Rochette Rock. So now our uh, sample collection uh, for Perseverance contains the following four samples. Uh, Rubion, which is our first sample attempt that we now consider our atmospheric sample. Then we have the Montagnier and Montagnac samples of these crater floor rocks that we tentatively interpret as uh, volcanic lava flows, but are still considering whether sedimentary interpretations uh, make sense uh, as well. Um, and then we sealed up one of our witness tubes. Um, we call it the bit carousel witness tube. And that was a, a witness tube that was open from the time the rover was in at low to the time that we sealed it on the surface of Mars. So able to document basically the, the state of the interior sample caching system all through launch, cruise, landing, and then the first couple of months on the surface of Mars. So we're, we are well on our way to filling the sample collection uh, for Perseverance and excited to continue our sampling mission. Okay, so I mentioned previously um, this important geologic contact that we might have been uh, skirting around. And so just before conjunction, we had the ability to actually drive and cross that contact, going from crater floor fractured rough to crater floor fractured one uh, here in an outcrop we call SETA. And so I'll show you um, some data from the RIMFAX instrument. Again, this is our ground penetrating radar. And this is just this. This image really blows my mind. I mean, here we are seeing in the subsurface actual real structure that we can then map to specific rock outcrops at the surface. And so these red arrows do that correlation here. And what we can see is these dipping rocks. Uh, these are dipping to about the south. Um, south is to the left here. And so we think that the rocks over in this part of the image uh, in, in this kind of uh, SETA outcrop are dipping and projecting underneath and are thus older than the rocks of our 2B ridge, including the, the rocks that we sampled. And so as we do this traverse, we're going from younger to older rocks and, and essentially going through time here in the history of the crater floor rocks uh, in Jezero. And so this is really neat to be able to link surface, surface rocks uh, with subsurface uh, structure. So a really exciting moment, I think, for, for the mission. Um, and so we, we drove out here uh, to this location of the blue dot and again, right before conjunction, we acquired another abrasion on these rocks. And you might notice that these rocks are, are much lighter toned um, than our previous ones. Um, and again, these rocks are layered and we're still very much in the process of figuring out what these rocks are, but I wanted to show you because this was our, our latest and greatest abrasion patch. Um, here, we think the rocks might be more likely to be, be perhaps sedimentary based on some of the textures and the layering that we see uh, in the outcrop. I wanted to talk really briefly um, about some of the other exciting observations that Perseverance has collected in addition to our focus on the crater floor. Of course, since landing, Perseverance has been uh, making uh, observations of the Martian atmosphere, and there's been some really neat uh, correlation and coordination amongst our, our instrument suite to observe the modern atmosphere and environment in, on, on, on Mars. And so here you can see on the left some images of, of dust devils in Jezero, and then the coordinated uh, sorry, meta um, observations as those dust devils were moving through the scene, um, seen in both the pressure dips um, as well as solar radiation and then the wind direction as well. You can kind of do that matching for when we, we thought we saw uh, the dust devils moving through. And then we can do a similar- left, Katie. Okay, thanks. Um, and then we can do a, a same kind of correlation here um, using the SuperCam microphone, um, actually hearing uh, the, the winds and the dust, the gustiness in the crater and then correlating that with the, the weather data. Um, I'll, I've got one more slide here. I just wanted to talk about um, a, our most recent study and our first study to come out from the mission uh, came out in science just uh, two weeks ago, um, reporting on results from the Jezero Delta observation. So again, most of our focus has been on the crater floor, but we've already been able to make distant observations of the Delta. And what we're seeing are, are beautiful outcrops uh, that tell us about the evolution of the delta in Jezero over time, and the fact that we think that some of the latest stage deposits were really high energy floods that might not have really been expected or that we didn't necessarily think were there um, from our previous orbiter studies. So we are very much learning new things about the Jezero delta and about the history of, of water in Jezero crater and, and on Mars as well. This is also helping focus our future uh, sampling strategy and, and efforts as we look ahead to once we're done with the crater floor and our attention turns toward the delta. So I'll end here uh, just with the return to our strategic mission path. There we are at the green star, um, but once we are finished uh, in the, the SETA area and the crater floor, we're gonna zoom around uh, the SETA outcrop, that mint-shaped out, shaped outcrop, 
and turn our attention to the Delta. And we're very excited to begin that phase of the mission um, sometime around our one year landing anniversary. So with that, hopefully I have a, a, a minute or two to take some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Hanging, uh, hang on for Q&A. Uh, hi, Katie. I hope, I hope you can hear me. My name is yes. Sagar and I will be asking you a few questions on the behalf of audience. So the first question which we have is, are there any NASA plans to place a satellite into an L4 or L5 orbit to mitigate the communication blackout during injection? Uh, sorry, could you, could you repeat the last part of the question? I think I heard the first part, but I'm not sure I caught the last part. So the question is, uh, are there any plans to mitigate the communication blackout during conjunction by placing satellites in L4 or L5 orbits? Oh, okay, yes, thank you. Um, so, so during conjunction, we uh, the orbiters and the rover can actually talk to us and, and we've been downlinking data uh, from the rover during conjunction. Uh, we just can't talk to to Mars and to the rovers, um, but we have we have been able to to to, to get data and, and we're actually now we're we're actually technically back though we haven't started planning and we are a, a, a seeing the data flow in now um, and Perseverance actually did science observations during conjunction and so um, as those data came down over the past couple of weeks our scientists were busy um, looking at observations to tell us about how uh, the modern environment changes doing change detection which is really good for when you're sitting in one place for a long time. Okay, so the next question is from Grant. He's asking regarding rim facts, how far down can it see with this radar and what is hope to be learned from it? Data and what yes. are the results which you have collected so far? Yes, great question. So um, how far rim facts can see down into the subsurface depends on what the subsurface is made of um, and, and how well the signal travels through the rocks. But uh, distances or, or, or depths up to 20 meters are, are possible. And really what RIMFACS can tell us is, is the geologic relationship and context of the rocks at the surface. And sometimes those relationships aren't so obvious at the surface and are better seen projected into the subsurface. And so, for example, like when we, we traversed that important geologic contact, we had a question, you know, which unit was older? And the RIMFACS data conclusively answered that for us as we saw very clear dipping beds of the older unit dipping and projecting underneath the younger unit. And so RIMFAX is particularly good for giving us the geologic context of the rocks that we are looking at at the surface by providing us the subsurface geologic relationships. Uh, we have this question from, from uh, has borate been measured in the samples which you have oh. collected so far? Okay, uh, no, I do not believe that we have observed borate um, yet. And so that is not yet a mineral that we have identified on Mars with Perseverance. Thanks a lot. And uh, we would love if you can stay and you can answer some of the questions uh, in the chat. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, Katie. The work you're doing is, is really amazing. And, uh, you know, in, it's really raising our understanding of the planet in great, great many ways. So thanks for being with us.